This, the Prime Minister likes to get away early. The more that you stop me getting on with the questions, the more I'm going to keep him here. So it's up to you how long you want the Prime Minister. Uh It will be a bad time to get thrown out. It's six weeks, I think, long and hard. Can I just say to the Prime Minister, it's opposition questions, it's Prime Minister's questions. Oh, we want some more. Who wants to lead the exit? When the Prime Minister took office nine months ago, the NHS waiting list had 7.2 million people on it. What's the number today? Well, Mr. The, Mr. Speaker, the, the reason that the NHS waiting lists are higher today than they were then, after actually being stable uh, for the first few months as we put in place new initiatives, is very simple, and that's because the NHS has been disrupted by industrial action, Mr. Speaker. Now, the, We've put very clear plans in place to bring down waiting lists in urgent and emergency care, in primary care, in ambulances and outpatients and electives. Those plans were working and will continue to work, but we do need to end the industrial action. So I'd ask the honourable gentleman, if he does care about bringing the waiting list down, does he agree with me that consultants and junior doctors should accept the pay deal that the government offers? Mr Speaker. This, the Prime Minister likes to get away early. The more that you stop me getting on with the questions, the more I'm going to keep him here. So it's up to you how long you want the Prime Minister. Dear Starmer. Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm sure the whole House is pleased that he's graced us with his presence today. But we don't get any more answers when he's here than when he's not. <laughs> He knows the answer. Seven point million people currently on the waiting list. Prime Minister, that's the highest it's ever been. It means that since he stepped foot into Downing Street, 260,000 people have been waiting in daily agony for things like hip and knee replacements while he boasts. Has he figured out why, after nine months, dozens of gimmicks, umpteen broken promises, his government is failing more patients than ever before. Mr Speaker, again, I don't think we heard an answer to the question. Right? So, so. And also, I don't want you holding up proceedings, Prime Minister. It's, it's very simple. If, if the Honourable Gentleman actually looked at what was happening earlier this year, what we have seen, what we have seen actually is that our plans were beginning to work. Ambulance and waiting times down from an hour and a half over Christmas to around half an hour, virtually eliminating the number of people waiting one and a half years for treatment, making huge progress on GP access. Now, all those things, all those plans we put in place, all the funding, all the extra ambulances, the extra discharge, all starting to make a difference, all held up by one very simple fact, industrial action in the NHS. Again, I'll give him a second chance. If he really wants to get people the health care that they want, will he agree with me that those doctors should accept the recommendations of the independent pay review body? Uh, um, it will be a bad time to get thrown out. It's six weeks, I think, long and hard. Can I just say to the Prime Minister, it's the opposition questions, it's Prime Minister's questions. Mr. Speaker, I think with his time away, he's slightly forgotten how this works. Yeah! And he, he talks about his plans. He talks about his plans, his NHS staffing plan. He doesn't need to lecture. Hold on, hold on. It might be the last one before recess, but I'd just say to somebody if they really want to take and go early, it will be very tempting to ensure that we do it. But think long and hard before you do. Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. He talks about his plans. He doesn't need to lecture me on that. On the NHS staffing plan, he nicked it from Labour. It's the same old story. They mess up the NHS and look to Labour to fix it. Come the election, the country will be doing the same. The difference is that, unlike us, he hasn't said how he'd pay for his workforce plan. Now's his chance. Where's the money coming from? Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, not only is, is the NHS long-term workforce plan fully funded, it was welcomed. It was welcomed. 
It was welcomed by not one, not two, but by 43 different NHS stakeholders, Mr Speaker. But you know, he talks about our plans and are they making a difference. Well, let's just look. Let's just look in urgent and emergency care. Our plans mean that we'll put 800 more ambulances on the road, 5,000 more beds, faster discharge, more community care. That's why the Royal College of Emergency Medicine described it as significant and that it will undoubtedly improve conditions. But that's why, Mr Speaker, what have we seen? A&E waiting times in England, the best in two years, Mr Speaker. Well, while, the, while, while, Mr Speaker, and they won't like this, while the NHS has the worst waiting times in the country in Wales, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, when he said the workforce plan was fully cost, I've never seen the Chancellor more bewildered. <laughs> It's less than a year since his party crashed the economy with their unfunded spending commitments, and he hasn't learned a thing. So let me ask it another way. Is his uncosted spending coming from more tax rises, more cuts, or is it just the latest promise to fall from the Tories' magic money tree? Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, as, as, as I and the Chancellor set out, the plan is fully funded. He will see that at the autumn statement. But I, I am pleased. I am pleased he's now, he's now interested in fiscal responsibility, because that is very welcome, Mr Speaker. Because well, there's an opportunity for us to make sure that this is true conviction. We've just had, Mr Speaker, in the last week, we've had the recommendations of independent pay review bodies, including, including for the NHS. Now, I believe the right thing to do was to accept those independent recommendations. But that involves taking difficult and responsible decisions to deliver those pay rises without fuelling borrowing inflation, taxes and debt. But on this crucial issue, Mr Speaker, while his MPs are back on the picket lines, yet, yet again on this issue, he simply refuses to take a position. It's the same old story. He should stop taking inspiration from his friends outside and unglue himself from the fence. Wants to lead the exit. Keir Starmer. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, in that burst of nonsense, what you didn't hear was a single word about how he's going to be paying for it. Labour's NHS workforce plan is fully funded by scrapping the non DOM status that he so adores. You know the one, that non DOM. Oh, 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 order, order. I think one or two of you have asked to catch my eye. You're not going the right way. Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Labour's work- workforce plan is fully funded by scrapping the non-dom status yeah. that he so adores. You know the one, the non-dom tax thing, as he calls it, that allows some of the wealthiest people in the country to avoid paying tax here. Is that loophole so important to him that he'd rather have billions in unfunded promises than simply making billionaires pay what they owe? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, this is. The, the, same, the same policy that has paid, I think, for five different things at this point. I think, Mr. Speaker, everybody knows, everybody knows that I'm a fan of doing maths to 18, but the honourable gentleman makes a very strong case for doing maths all the way to 61, quite frankly. Yeah. When it comes, Mr. Speaker. But when it, when it comes to the substance of the plan, because it's important we address this, right? I, I am aware, actually, and I, and I will say this: he did, and he did set out some proposals to train more staff. The problem is, Mr. Speaker, that's all he did. Our plan is much more comprehensive and it's much more impactful because not only will we train more staff, Mr. Speaker. Well, no, this is important substance because I acknowledge the party opposite did set out some plans to train more, but that's not enough. You also have to set out plans as we did to retain more NHS staff. And you also crucially, you also crucially have to set out plans to how you reform the NHS so that you can have a more productive NHS. And that is the difference between us, Mr. Speaker. He is only ever focused on the superficial headline. We're getting on and doing the actual reform. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if he's so good at maths, then I'm 60, not 61. I don't know whether the Prime Minister has found time to visit Hillingdon Hospital during the recent by-elections, 
where the wards have had to close, staff are working in appalling conditions and patient safety is at risk. And that is simply a snapshot of the wider problem. This week, the National Audit Office set out in detail what everyone already knows. The Government's hospital programme has, shall we say, some gaps in it. So can the Prime Minister confirm that, apart from the fact that there aren't 40 of them, and the fact that most of them aren't new, yeah. and that many of them aren't even hospitals, yeah. everything's going fine with the 40 new hospitals. Yeah. Oh. Mr. Mr Speaker, not only are we going to deliver on our manifesto commitment to build 40 new hospitals across the country by 2030, we're not, we're not just stopping there, Mr Speaker, because we're also delivering 100 hospital upgrades across the country, and, crucially, 100 over 100 new community diagnostic centres to speed up treatment for people, including, Mr Speaker, in the Deputy Leader's constituency, the Shadow Work and Pension Secretary's constituency, the Energy Secretary, the, the Justice Secretary, the Attorney General's constituency. That's how committed we are, Mr Speaker. But look, let me end on this, because he mentioned Hillingdon Hospital, he mentioned Uxbridge. I tell you what, I want to help the people of this country, Mr Speaker. I want to make sure that not only can they get to work, but they get the care they need. Why? on earth does he want to charge them £12.50 every time they visit their GP and hospital? Thank you, Mr Speaker. There was welcome news this morning of inflation falling by higher than expected. The businesses in my constituency are trying to plan their pricing for next January and are struggling because of the proposals to introduce the extended producer responsibility. and They do not yet have the information on how much it will cost or how it will work. Um, so would the Prime Minister look at pausing and resetting that programme? What we don't see in January is price rises in our supermarkets without the consequent a reduction, a reduction in packaging and increase in recycling that we all want to see. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank my honourable friend for the question. This is something that has been uh, raised with me uh, by those in the industry. Now, we are committed to protecting the environment and delivering, delivering on our net zero targets, uh, but DEFRA are continuing to engage closely with manufacturers, retailers and packaging companies on the precise design of the scheme. And I know that ministers will continue to keep this House and my honourable friend updated. Leader of the SNP, Stephen Flynn. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the two-child benefit cap, as introduced by the Conservative Party, has left 250,000 children living in poverty. So can I ask the Prime Minister, does he take comfort in knowing that the heinous legacy of that policy will no longer just be protected by Conservative members, but by Labour members too? Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, I welcome the uh, Labour leader's newfound support for our policy, even though he previously committed to a different approach. But what I would say to the honourable gentleman and indeed the Labour front bench is that they don't have to worry too much, because given the Labour leader's track record, he's never actually kept a promise that he's made. <laughs> Stephen Flynn. Mr Speaker, voters in Scotland are used to child poverty under the Tories. They almost expect it. But what they don't expect, what they don't expect is child poverty support from the Labour Party. And if we look very closely right now, there is a shiver running along the Labour front bench looking for a spine. Now, Mr Speaker, does this not tell us something much big uh-huh. bigger than for children living in poverty in Scotland? Westminster offers them no real change. It offers them no real hope. Well, Mr Speaker, the best, the best route out of poverty is through work, Mr Speaker. Uh, and, the most, and the best way to ensure that children do not grow up in poverty is to ensure that they do not grow up in a workless household. Uh, that is why we are focused on creating more jobs, with 200,000 more in Scotland since 2010, and hundreds of thousands fewer children across the United Kingdom growing up, fewer growing up in a workless household. We will always continue to reduce child poverty. I don't want to see a single child grow up in poverty, and we will deliver that in every part of the UK, including in Scotland. Yeah.